Welcome to Applied Research Methods in Sports and Kinesiology, KINE 5301. This is Module 2. In this module, we'll look at the introduction to research process in sports management. The topics that we'll cover will include the following. Chapter 3, the creation of research questions. Chapter 4, research design. Chapter 5, data collection and analysis. And Chapter 6, data publication. When we look at Chapter 3, the creation of research questions, uh, we look at the following objectives. Discussing common methods used in selecting a research problem identifying potential sources for conducting a literature review, understanding criteria for writing a high quality literature review, and the five steps in developing a conceptual framework, along with finally creating research questions. The value of creating research questions is very important, but we must first start with a biblical foundation. So for chapter three, creation of research question, our biblical foundation is found in John the 16th chapter and the 30th verse. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. From that biblical foundation, we look at problem selection as our first area. For in this chapter, the existence of literature is very important because it gives us the potential research problems or topics that can come from this. Certain social concerns. Research ideas can be rooted in contemporary social concerns as well as problems. And popular issues. Research ideas that can also be found in popular contemporary news sources. So from this problem selection, we begin and we continue by looking at either Personal characteristics, which are personal experiences and previous occupational duties that can provide great research problems. Brainstorming is another area where we dialogue with others and it can help to develop research problems. Practitioners, they can usually or actually provide problems that are needing help with and won't solve. So in each of these areas, uh, we're able to kind of begin our foundational development of creating a research question. Some of our sources of literature include the following. There are a vast number of potential sources for a research project. It can come from peer-reviewed journals, books and textbooks, conference papers, websites, newspapers, as well as magazines. It can also come from master's and doctoral thesis, as well as dissertation. The quality of a source is very important because all sources aren't really reliable. Uh, but when we look at the source itself, it does include primary data or secondary data. The authors, the question is, what are their qualifications and expertise? The question of sources popularity. Do other sites cite it frequently? The date of publication, when was it published? Is it still relevant? And the sources perceive accuracy and quality. These are five important areas when looking at the quality of the source. We also want to look at the selection of high quality sources. First, you look at electronic databases. Some examples include Sport Discus, Psych Info, ERIC, which is the Education Resource Information Center. You look at the library catalogs. Uh, I know traditionally, you may have gone into the library, but uh, now we use electronic library catalogs. But the, the catalog is the main location for master's thesis and doctoral dissertation. And it's a very great resource. You can conduct internet researches uh, through Google Scholar. It contains peer-reviewed online journals. You can look at peer-reviewed journals either in print or online. And then you begin the process of writing the literature review. Within this process, you want to first introduce the problem, uh, determine whether it's broad or a narrow approach that you want to use. 
by looking at background information. And this gives way to more pertinent information. You want to emphasize not just the methodologies, but previous pertinent research. You also want to differentiate how your research is different from previous studies. Some other questions to ask regarding your literature review. First, is the included literature related to the actual problem that you're looking at? Is the literature too broad or too narrow? Are all seminal works included? And this is very crucial in, in developing of your lit review. Are the most recent studies included? Is the review logically organized? And is there a brief introduction and conclusion? These six areas are important when addressing questions to ask regarding your literature review. And finally, the seventh one is does the review provide a rationale for your research questions? Five important steps in developing a conceptual framework. First, we must define what a conceptual framework is. It's a lens or framework that links concepts from the literature itself to your problem. You want to identify relevant concepts in the study. You want to define these relevant concepts. How will each variable be measured? And what variables change the relationship between other variables? For example, are they moderate or do they even explain the relationship from a mediate standpoint? Next, you want to identify the relationship between each of the variables. The next step in this process is to look at the creation of the research question itself. Does the question address or does the question address gaps or weaknesses in the existing literature? This is very important as you begin this process. Is the question clear and concise? Is the question too broad or too narrow? In steps two and three, clear and conciseness as well as broadness or narrowness are very important components when you're doing research. Fourth, can the question be answered logistically or in a reasonable manner? Next, can I access the necessary information to answer the question? These are all important steps. And then, is the question significant itself? When looking at research questions, you also look to see Hmm, research should be what? Is it manageable? You need to be able to realistically research the problem as well as complete the study. Hmm, well, is it meaningful? You should be interested in your study itself. And it should have some type of significance to you. And it could even be in your occupational field. So research in these areas is very important. As we shift from chapter three, the creation of research questions, chapter four focuses on research design. The objectives as we look at this chapter include the following. <clears throat> we understand the three major research designs or modes of inquiry and their strengths and weaknesses. We want to understand how to select an appropriate sample size. You want to understand the concept of reliability and its types. You also want to understand the concept of validity and its types. Our biblical foundation for this chapter, research de design in chapter four, is as follows. We find that biblical foundation in Ezekiel 43 and 11, for it reads, and if they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the temple, its arrangement, its exits, and its entrances, that is, its whole design, and make known to them as well all its statutes and its whole design, and all its laws, and write it down in their sight, so that they may observe all its laws and all its statutes and carry them out. So as we can see, not only biblically, but in research, uh, design is very important. So looking at research designs, this is also known as the modes of inquiry, and there are typically two main types. The first type is qualitative research. 
The second type is quantitative research. But there is also a third type of research that is becoming more scholarly acceptable, and that's what's known as the mixed methods research design. So these three types will be further discussed as we look at research design. The first area we want to look at is qualitative research. This type of research typically analyzes rich and subjective data. It is often collected using open-ended questions. It usually deals with small sample sizes. And qualitative research techniques typically include the following. Interviews, observations, small sample surveys, first person accounts. The strengths of qualitative research. It tends to give depth and richness of results. It gives the researcher the opportunity to ask follow up questions that are not feasible when using large scale surveys. There's a level of flexibility for the researcher as well as the participants and the ability to address complex why questions is possible. So from qualitative research we now look at quantitative research. Will you become a qualitative researcher or will you become a quantitative researcher? Two great options of the three that we'll mention in this module. Quantitative research typically tests theories by examining the relationships between different variables. It is typically used to test a theory statistically rather than to build theory as is in the case with qualitative research. Variables are usually measured by instruments that produce numerical data for statistical analysis. It often uses closed-ended questions. Some strengths of qualitative research include the following. One is able to take data from a sample and generalize it to a larger population because of statistical accuracy. Precise measurements of variables is given. The ability to statistically test research questions and hypotheses arises. And the opportunity to long longitudinally measure the subject's subsequent performance. These strengths are very important. Again, research, qualitative, now quantitative. And our third component we look at is the mixed methods research. Uh, this type of research can capitalize on the strengths of both qualitative and quantitative research. It uses techniques from both qualitative and quantitative research to triangulate the research results. Uh, meaning it reaches the same conclusion through the use of multiple methods. So through mixed methods research, uh, we see that there are three types of strong mixed method research design. The first is the sequential mixed method. Beings with either a qualitative or quantitative method then uses the other method to explain the initial findings. So for example, you would do qualitative, and then you will follow it up with quantitative, which would then expand the initial finding or vice versa. Uh, second one is the concurrent mixed methods. It converges both qualitative and quantitative data in order to provide a comprehensive analysis of the research problem. And the third type is the transformative mixed methods approach. It uses a theoretical lens as an overarching viewpoint within a design that uses both research styles. Next, we look at the sampling and sample size. In order to select a sample, the researcher must first define the population itself. First, you have probability sampling, which is a random sample where every member of a selected population has an equal probability of being selected. Secondly, one may use a non-probability sampling approach. This is also known as a convenience sample where a population is chosen based upon convenience and a specific criteria. The goal is to select a sample that is large enough to be representative of the population. Next, we look at the term reliability. This refers to the consistency of the results obtained through research. It concerns the extent to which the research instrument yields the same results on repeated trials. 
If consistent, the results are produced from the research instrument. Then this gives the researcher confidence to move forward. Another important topic is validity. So you have research that has certain components that we seek reliability, but we also seek validity. So again, going back to that original design component, validity is the extent to which the research instrument accurately measures what it was designed to measure. Does it accurately address its design purpose is a question. Does it measure what it is intended to? If your research instrument is not valid, then your whole research study will not be valid or accurate. That completes chapter four. This is kind of the halfway point of module two. So now looking at creation of research questions, chapter three, chapter four, looking at the research design. Now we shift into chapter five which looks at data collection and analysis. As we usually do, there are certain objectives that we want to seek to achieve. These objectives are as follows. Understanding the concept of non-response bias in data collection. Understanding strategies for increasing survey response rates. Understanding the process of data coding. And understanding the four types of descriptive statistics. These are our objectives for this chapter, along with understanding how to select an appropriate statistical design. Our biblical foundation for chapter five, data collection and analysis can be found in Nahum, the second chapter and the first verse. It reads, the scatterer has come up against you. Man the ramparts, watch the road, dress for battle and collect all of your strength so as we move into data collection it is very important to focus on that verse the non-response bias this occurs when there is a systematic difference between the respondents and the non-respondents researchers hope to avoid low response rates because they may indicate bias in the data itself and it could alter the researcher's preferred data analysis technique. We see that there are increasing survey response rates. Uh, this includes the follow-up reminders that have been shown to increase the response rates. Researchers can also offer inducements, which is the objects of value to the participants, to individuals who agree to participate in a study. Another way to increase the response rate is to use a pre-notification letter focusing on the positive aspects of participating in the study. Next, we seek to code the data. This involves grouping and assigning numeric codes to the various responses to a particular question. For closed-ended questions, the coding process involves assigning a number for each respective possible response. For open-ended questions, all responses are listed coded by similar response and even frequency. So again, as we talked about quantitative and qualitative research, including open-ended and closed-ended questions, this is when that information is then coded. From there, we develop descriptive statistics. These include a number of data analysis options with the express purpose of describing or summarizing the data. In most cases, the researcher wants to incorporate descriptive statistics in a study to summarize information about a given sample. There are four main types of descriptive statistics that we will discuss. The first one is the measure of central, central tendency. These measures permit the researcher to describe a set of data with a single numerical value. This value that represents the average or typical value associated with the data set. The most common measures of central tendency are the mean, the median, and the mode. When looking at the mean, the median, and the mode, we first define the mean as simply the arithmetic average of a set of scores. The median is the score that divides the upper 50% from the 
from the lower 50%. And the mode is the most frequently occurring score in a distribution. This does not account for the value or order of scores in the data set itself. So those three components, mean, median, and mode, are important. Secondly, the measures of variability. These measures give an indication of how scores are spread around the mean or another measure of central tendency. A would include the standard deviation, which measures the average distance of scores from the mean. B, the variance. It measures variability and is calculated simply by squaring the value of the standard deviation. The next area we look at is the measure positive or at least the measure of relative position. One thing I'll mention at this time is that uh, in terms of the actual formulas and the calculations, I would definitely reference your textbook or for additional support, reference outside resources that deal with these elements of uh, your measurement. We have the measurement, again, a positive or relative position. These measures indicate where a specific score is located in relation to the rest of the scores in a distribution. We have the percentile rank. It indicates the percentage of scores that fall at or below a given score. We also have standard scores, which are a manipulation of a raw score that indicates how far away from the mean a given score is located. Next, we look at the measures of relationship. These measures indicate the degree to which two quantifiable variables are related to each other. They verify only that a relationship exists between two variables, but they do not imply a casual relationship. X is related to Y, but X does not cause Y. It's very important to understand. Again, X is related to Y, but X does not cause Y. The statistical design. Uh, when determining which statistical design to use, you want to follow the following steps. First, you want to identify the variables in the research question. That is the independent as well as the dependent variable. Uh, indicate which variables are the independent and dependent variable, as well as the covariance. You want to determine the type of variables, categorical or quantitative. You also want to determine the purpose of the research question. You want to apply the information from the preceding steps to arrive at the appropriate design. This completes our focus in module two as it relates to chapter five. Our last component of chapter six in module two will discuss dissemination of your findings. The objectives, are to understand the process of presenting research in an academic conference. You also want to understand how to select a journal to target for submission of a manuscript. You want to identify the major structural components of a research article or manuscript. You want to also understand the process for submitting a manuscript to a journal for review. Our biblical foundation in this chapter of dissemination of findings in chapter 6 can be found in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter and the 20th verse, which reads, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. That biblical foundation sets the standard for us as we look at this chapter. The first area we want to look at is academic conference presentations. Today, sports management and kinesiology researchers enjoy a variety of scholarly conferences. Academic conferences generally publish a call for papers several months prior to the submission deadline. The call typically includes specific submission requirements. Academic conference presentations typically fall in the following categories. You have A, oral presentations, which are typically 15 to 20 minutes. Typically PowerPoint presentations categorized similar to scholarly papers. Then you have the oral symposium. 
Uh, it's 45 to 90 minutes typically. It could include panel discussions or multiple presenters. Then you have poster presentations. These are display boards where researchers illustrate their data and describe their studies. So I would definitely encourage you as you move forward in this program uh, to consider maybe presenting at an academic conference in the future. The academic journal selection. Uh, first, the researcher must decide where to submit the manuscript. The internet has made it easier to find different journals that are interesting and relate to your different research. Secondly, the researcher should ensure that the manuscript conforms to the publication's guidelines for potential authors. The manuscript st structure, mostly scholarly research studies published in an academic journal, contain the following. A specific title, uh, an abstract, a literature review, a research methods section, a results section, as well as a discussion section. So the structure is as or aforementioned. The specific title and abstract. It includes the title for an academic manuscript and is typically brief by design. And it commonly refers to the population of interest in the variable studies that it refers to. An abstract is a brief summary of the research and it addresses the study's purpose, the research question, the methods, the results, as well as the implications. The literature review. This typically features a broad to narrow focus and it makes liberal use of subheadings to actually guide the reader. It provides a critical review of previous research and it identifies certain trends, themes, and gaps in the literature. And it ultimately generates a justification for the study at hand. The research methods section. It often includes three main subsections. First, participants where it identifies and selects the participants. Secondly, the instrumentation. It describes the tools that will be used to collect the data. And then thirdly, data analysis, which describes the specific analysis procedure in the study. So these three main subsections are very important to this section. The next section we look at is the results section. It reports the findings associated with data analysis. It often includes visual aids, i.e. tables. These findings are often reported in order to, to the specific, at least these findings are often reported in order according to the specific research question or hypothesis that they address. The next section is the discussion section. It typically concludes with an outline of the specific strengths and limitations of the study, as well as treatment of any potential practical implications. Some researchers also thoughtfully include recommendations for future research, and that is future with an E. Next, the journal publication process. This process takes place once a research manuscript and cover letter have been received by the journal's editor. The peer review process then begins. The journal editor then forwards a blind copy of the manuscript to a group of anonymous reviewers. Once they receive it, they judge the quality of the manuscript and its suitability for publication in that particular journal. The review can typically take maybe four to six weeks or to, you know, so many months. And at that point, a decision is made to either accept the manuscript as is, accept the manuscript after minor revisions, or to request a revision and a resubmission. Or it may be rejecting the manuscript outright as a whole. So now, what's next? I know this module covered a lot of information, chapters three, four, five, and six. But ultimately, this is a critical component of conducting research. So moving forward, we want you to complete your detailed reading, answer the discussion questions, complete the writing assignment, and continue participating in the course. This concludes module two of KINE 5.
5301.